So while they're getting ready, I have uh, having some display issues. So if you see me look over to my left, it's because I don't see the slides. I've got a copy here, so I don't have a, a tick or anything. It's, I can't see the, but we'll get through it. We'll get through it. I know, yeah, it's a... Uh, uh. Okay, um, so thanks for coming to the talk. My name is Josh Datko. I will be talking about um, crypto for makers, so uh, projects to do with the BeagleBone, Raspberry Pi, AVR, Arduino. Um, we are um, going to talk about a few things. We're going to kind of motivate the problem, why I care about this, and why I think people should care about kind of doing security with embedded devices. Going to give a quick device overview uh, for those who maybe are unfamiliar with some of these. Go to a very quick crypto background, um, what kind of why I'm interested in hardware crypto. Uh, I built with uh, SparkFun, made this device called the CryptoCape, so I'm going to kind of talk about what uh, that process was. Walk through each of the security I see, so I've been kind of playing with some embedded crypto chips that I think are interesting. And then um, lastly, I have this project where I run a Tor Relay on a BeagleBone, um, and so I'm going to talk about how to do that. So. Bruce Schneier has this article back in January called The Internet of Things is Wildly Insecure and Often Unpatchable. And mainly he's talking about routers and uh, the embedded um, systems community typically has been pretty bad with uh, security and uh, he's, among other people, are concerned about up upgrading the Internet of Things. And he offers three points that are kind of call to actions. The first is um, that we should have open source drivers, right? So no binary blobs. And so the maker community is actually pretty good about this, right? Almost too good, right? So I joke, you can tell a hardware engineer um, if they use forms as their uh, get, uh, source control, right? So if they are posting things to forums and they're like, oh, I made a change, and they post their Arduino sketch and they post it again. Oh, here's Rev2. It's like, oh, guys, you know, learn Git, you know? Um, so that's all you can tell hardware engineers and software engineers uh, on forums. Um, but so makers are generally pretty good about releasing open source drivers, and I think um, we're pretty good about this. Uh, the next thing is having an au automatic software update mechanism. And so, um, again, talking about routers, the problem here is that you have a binary blob router. It needs to update because the heart bleed, and there's no way to update it because it's one, it's binary, so you can't even fix it if you wanted to, and two, there's just no way to update this router, so you're stuck with this router that is uh, contributing to this you know, botnet, um, and then you know, everybody's kind of stuck. And so, the third thing is we need to uh, design secure systems. So this is kind of like, okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, thanks for the tip. Got it. Um, uh, but what I wanted to do in, in kind of in this area is I wanted to make, I wanted to make a tool that would help with this. And so um, I think that m makers are driving the internet of things, you know, not companies. So the projects that we're doing, we're connecting things to the internet. I think that's really driving the conversation. And so I wanted um, to make this tool that would help people secure that, and then so this talk is basically about the story of me getting into that and trying to build this tool that hopefully helps people secure their projects um, a little better. So this is an Arduino Uno. It's a 8-bit um, AVR. Arduino obviously, you know, Arduino also makes 32-bit uh, versions. This is the 8-bit version. Uh, uses that Mega's 320AP. It has a 2K SRAM, excuse me, 1K EEPROM. 16 megahertz at the five volt version. If you lower the voltage to 3.3 volts, it'll run uh, at eight megahertz. A lot of stuff, different I.O., right? So you can do a lot of fun stuff with this. Um, the nice thing about Arduino Uno is it has no operating system, right? So you can get very real time control. Um, so you can do very kind of fixed timing things. The bad thing about Arduino Uno is it has no operating system. So if you're trying to do any kind of you know, sophisticated projects that need some sort of software library, you, you know, you're kind of stuck because um, it just, it doesn't run in OS. And so for this talk, um, if I say Arduino, I'm generally referring to the AVR versions. I, I know there's other ones there, but um, if, I, if I say Arduino, I mean an AVR version. So this is the Raspberry Pi. This is actually the B+, it just was announced. And I always think it's funny when hardware guys use um, letters to indicate it, because it always gets a, a worse grade, right? It came out the A, now it's the B, now the B+. So, uh, so this is the B+. Um, it, a 700 megahertz processor, it can be overclocked. 512 megabyte RAM has the composite video, and so that was one of the changes with the B+, is it has that nice four pin, or everything's in that one connector. Uh, lots of different GPIO, SPI, I2C, UART. It has a hardware random number generator, so I think that's interesting from the crypto point of view. 
It runs Raspbian, which isn't quite Debian ARM, ARM HF, so there are some issues trying to get some software there, but um, they do their best trying to make this Raspbian distribution um, that'll work on the Raspberry Pi. And so this is actually my platform of choice, the Beagle Bone Black. Uh, I like it because it's got the one gigahertz um, ARM processor, the 512 megabytes RAM, so that's the same. It has two independent programmable real-time units, so this hasn't really gotten a lot of attention, mainly because the C compiler wasn't released, uh, I think about two months ago, but this gives you nanosecond um, guaranteed execution, right? They're both independent. They have a shared memory interface to the main processor. And so you can kind of combine microcontroller stuff with uh, Prus and um, do some neat stuff with that. And that, like I said, the C compiler is out now, so that should help. And I've seen on the beagleboard.org groups a lot more interest in this now. It has crypto accelerators for AES, SHA, and MD5, right? So these also haven't gotten a lot of attention mainly because the OMAP driver is in uh, 3.13, and the Beagle ships with a 3A kernel. But if you upgrade to 3.13, which is actually easy to do with the scripts, um, you will have those drivers. The, I'll talk about it a little bit this later. They're still a little bit hard to use, but the hardware is there to do uh, acceleration of these algorithms. Um, plenty of I.O., as you can see. It also has a generally purpose memory controller, analog digital converters, uh, has a CAN bus, right? So if you want to hook it up to your car, uh, that could be kind of neat. It's also fully open source hardware, so you can go build this yourself. All the design files are published. You can also build a product around it, right? So the one from CircuitCo is not really recommended because uh, most of the distributors have kind of limited to one purchase per person, but um, Embist makes a, a clone, and there are some other clones that are out there that, you know, if you want to buy like 100 of them, um, you could do so. Okay, so now uh, just a kind of a quick background of you know, why if you're making something and, and, and why you would need crypto. And this is really, if you're trying to, if you're kind of new to this and trying to look up information, these are kind of like the terms you should Google because you'll find better results, um, right? So if you run into a problem, if you have two devices and you want to verify the, authentic, um, the identity of these two devices, the word you're looking for is authentication. Um, that's a feature of cryptography which will, which will do that. The other problem is if you have, uh, you want to keep some data secret, right? So this is a confidentiality feature of cryptography. Um, the next one is, right, to verify your data didn't change, right? So this is like if you see something on the internet and you download it and it has this kind of 20 byte value after it and that's something you totally should verify but probably don't, um, that is uh, an integrity feature of cryptography. And then lastly is, you know, how do you prove a device performs some action? And so this is a non-repudiation feature. And so uh, if you haven't heard that term before, basically to repudiate something is to deny something, non-repudiate to make sure that you can't deny it. Okay, so why am I uh, interested in hardware crypto? Well, I think hardware crypto provides uh, three features. So uh, the first feature is kind of a little bit obvious. If you um, have an AVR, right, and you need a random number generator or you need a certain algorithm, the hardware crypto acts, acts basically as a library, right? So you put the hardware chip on there, right, then you gain that feature, right? So if you are limited because you are only working with the AVR, then, you know, you may just certainly need a hardware embedded chip to provide the feature you're going to use. Otherwise, you're going to have to use your um, memory and that may, you may, may or not have that uh, because of whatever the application that you're trying to do. The second uh, thing, which I think is a feature of hardware crypto, is to do algorithm acceleration, right? So you can offload some of the crypto to the, a special coprocessor, and that will accelerate that algorithm, leaving your CPU to handle whatever the uh, task was that the CPU was supposed to handle. And the third feature, which I think hardware crypto provides, is key protection. So these are mainly for uh, asymmetric algorithms, so public-private key pairs, right? But hardware crypto that generates the private key in the hardware and doesn't release it uh, is of special interest to me, um, and we'll be talking mostly about this third feature. Okay, so uh, to touch briefly on crypto acceleration. So crypto acceleration is very useful when you have a higher priority CPU bound task, right? So if you're doing network traffic, a lot of times you'll see this in the web server world with hardware security modules. And so they'll have something like a PCIe uh, hardware crypto accelerator attached and they'll offload all their SSL to these um, hardware security modules. These things cost like tens of thousands of dollars and they're FIPS 140-2 certified, right? And so um, that's a little bit more expensive than a BeagleBone. Um, so, but the BeagleBone has those crypto accelerators. Um, so if you're, if you're using it as like a VPN server or something like this, it'd be really nice to offload that AES traffic to lower the CPU usage. Um, also, a lot of people use BeagleBone Blacks for robotics and robotic vision, right? So it's doing some sort of machine learning algorithm. That's taking a lot of CPU. It's also communicating over network. You really want that robotic um, device to have the, also that real-time capability. Crypto acceleration would be nice. So I tried to do this, right? So I've got some blog posts um, that you can go look on how to 
basically what I tried to do with this. Um, it's a little bit complicated because you have to kind of statically compile everything and have upgrade the kernel. Um, but if you're kind of looking to jump off of what I've done, uh, you can go to that link and see what, you know, how far I got. Okay, so, uh, so the, now I'm going to talk about in context of this CryptoCape, uh, which you may not know yet, but basically I wanted to have this device and I wanted, uh, back in the end of last year, one of this device that would provide key protection for some of these asymmetric algorithms. I wanted a battery back up RTC, so, so that's important for security systems to have kind of accurate time. I wanted this idea of having this trusted controller, right? So I wanted an ability to upload some sort of software to another microprocessor or microcontroller and then know that, that a software vulnerability couldn't change the software running on that piece of hardware. And I wanted it to be hackable and fun. So this is um, kind of important, right? So I wanted to make a device that I think other people would pick up and be like, whoa, I can make this project or I can do this. And so um, trying to introduce some fun into this, uh, into this kind of otherwise very serious business here. So uh, November 2013, I kind of made this diagram. And I was like, well, I, f I found these chips. They all look pretty cool. You know, they're all on an I2C bus. You know, so I think I can do something like this. And uh, as you can see there, or maybe you can't read, but they're basically all Atmel chips. And so I went shopping around for um, you know, chips that would do this. And basically, you know, I looked at a whole bunch of different vendors, tried to do uh, the research. And you know, really, it, Atmel was kind of like the clear chip provider here. So uh, first of all, like I knew of Atmel from the Arduino community. So I was like, OK, so I know these guys. Their chips are available on DigiKey and Mauser, so that's a big win, right? Um, typically, some of these uh, vendors will have NDA chips, and you can't buy them through the normal distributors, so that's kind of like, you know, you first have to do this NDA dance, and uh, some vendors are not really willing to give it to individuals, so, okay, so I've got this company, right, so I can probably get the NDA thing, but then it's like, well, then I can't really distribute it because they don't, you know, everything's NDA'd, so it's kind of like, uh, well, I mean, your chip looks nice, but it's not really gonna work, so, um, so that was another thing. Uh, so this is kind of a big distinguisher for me because a lot of the documentation is freely available. So they do have some NDA chips, but for a lot of their chips in the crypto line, the whole spec is published, right? So if you don't have an NDA spec, it's really hard to write a driver for it, but uh, Atmel does relief, uh, release um, the full specs for them. And so even their NDA chips, they produce a code library. So, so the, the document is under NDA, but they have a library that you can go download and then basically see the features you want to use in that library. So I don't know of any other vendor that just you know, has code out there. Um, so that's kind of a big win. And I'm on the wrong screen, sorry. OK, so um, and then you know, they have some dev kits right, that you can get, again, from DigiKey and Mauser. Um, they have demo software that do all this stuff. So basically, I found Atmel to be very um, maker-friendly, right? So if people are working with Arduino, um, they you know, may have already known that, but um, the, even for their security ICs, which I don't think got a lot of attention, um, I've found them to be great to work with. Um, and so if you look at their dev kits, right? So these are some of the dev kits. The one on your left, right, has this nice socket interface. And if you're doing anything with like SOIC 8s, Oh man, like a socket is really nice because you just pop it in there and these crypto chips have these features where they have one uh, locking mechanisms, right? So you burn the one-way fuses. So the, basically the idea is you set up the chip, you tell it, hey, uh, this is how I want to use the keys. This is like how I'm going to set up my management team. You burn the fuse, right? And then you, can, you can't go back. Um, so if you have this already started to a board and then you're trying to write this driver and then it's like, ah, oh, well, crap, what do I do, right? So if it's in the socket, it's like really nice to just pop it in and, you know, so that, that's kind of a cool thing. But even if you're doing anything without SOIC 8, like you should look into getting a socket if you do any kind of stuff like this. And then the one on your right um, is uh, one of their TPM breakouts, right? So if you're doing things, we'll talk about the TPM later, but it has this nice breakaway header so you can kind of set it up, you know, break the board and then kind of plug it into whatever you're doing. So, so they have some nice, um, they have some nice stuff. And so, um, so I was like, okay, I want to build this thing. It's like, well, this is kind of like a little bit complicated. There's a lot of chips there. So maybe I should start a little smaller. And I discovered Tindy. And so who here has heard of Tindy? Okay, you guys have not heard it. We'll drop like 100 bucks when you go check it out, right? It's like the Etsy for electronics. I mean, people are putting, you know, from things they make one of to things they make 10 of up on Tindy. And it's just like anything you can think of electronics that guys are making with themselves or using like Osh Park to produce the boards, hand soldering things, putting it on Tindy and people are you know, shipping all over the world. So like I had one of the, something shipped to the Ukraine in Kiev like right after the whole thing, and I was like, oh, hopefully it gets there. Um, I had to go to the post office and explain like why I was shipping something to Ukraine. I was like, oh, this guy wants this crypto thing. I, I don't know, you know, hopefully. Maybe he's trying to protect himself. So um, 
So yeah, so someone bought it in Kiev, and I, as far as I know, he got there. I mean, he didn't complain about not getting it. So, um, but yeah, so so I, I built basically. So I was like, okay, I should probably start small. Um, I it's very easy to set everything up on Tindy. So I took the AT SHA two hundred four. I was one of the chips, right? I took like three weeks, three to four weeks. Started with our spec, wrote a whole GPL driver for it, um, you know, to make it Linux compatible instead of AVR compatible. Called it the Hashlet, so it does hashing small. You know, I kind of suck at names. Um, you know, so, and then I uh, put it up on Tindy, and then, you know, I made these like breakout boards, right? So it's I squared C, so it works on the Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone, and, you know, people were like, oh, this is cool, this is kind of thing. I was like, oh, okay, so maybe there's, you know, some interest um, in doing something like this, right? And so then I found uh, these guys, which you may have heard of. Um, so I did a hacker in residence program at SparkFun, and I just want to tell you about this program because it is very, very cool. So you apply to this hacker in residence, right now it's like a two week thing, and uh, you tell them about your project, and then they, there's a little application thing, and you basically have to do a tutorial for them, right, some sort of blog post, you do a lunch and learn, and then you uh, kind of have to like share your project, but in return for all that, um, you get the following. So you get to stay in downtown Boulder, Colorado. Uh, so Colorado is nice. And there are certain things you can only do in Colorado, like um, hiking and, yeah, I can't. There's some other things that recently came to, but you know, maybe that's you know, uh, attraction for you. But, so you get to stay in downtown Boulder, Colorado. Um, you get to you know, work among a Spark Fund engineering department. So they give you like a seat. They're like, here's your soldering iron. Here's your hot air station. You know, here you go. And you're like, oh, OK, that's cool. Thank you. Um, Obviously, you get access to the uh, Spark Fund engineers if you have questions, right? And so generally, there's you know at least like one or two people who are kind of interested in whatever niche area you're doing, and then you just talk about some cool stuff, and then you know dogs come by, and you're like, oh, is that a dog? And they're like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah right. So, um, so uh, very cool, like just to be in that kind of environment. I've you know worked for like big companies and everything before, so this was kind of a different place. It's like, are you guys getting paid or just? Oh, okay. um, and then this is the best part, right? You get a hardware budget and really fast shipping, right? So you, it's like, I'm kind of there, right? And I'm working on this thing and I get some like SOIC, you know, breakout boards and some TSOP breakout boards and like, oh, I burned one of these chips. And then I go to the point of contact. Um, so I'll try not to embarrass her. But uh, I was like, hey, you know, can I get some more? And they're like, oh, okay, yeah. But why don't you like, you know, put a one big wish list together and then that way I only have to make one trip. And I was like, okay. Right, so I started like looking through, right? And I'm like, huh. I really could use some like digital calipers because um, you know this IC has got to be in the spec of the data sheet, and uh, yeah, so I guess so I can use some of those, and I probably should make sure it works on a Raspberry Pi, and like so, it's it's pretty cool. Then it kind of just magically shows up, um, so that's that's kind of fun. The the chips were in the data sheet, right? They were within the spec, so I did measure them, um, but digital calipers are nice for all sorts of things. So yeah, so while I was there, I basically built built this, and so this is the prototype CryptoCape, right? Got it all into a breadboard. Um, cooked everything together, kind of make sure it was working, and then we were able, uh, so working with uh, some SparkFun guys, we were able to kind of turn that um, into this, right? So this is the CryptoCape, and so what this has on there is uh, two different authentication chips, right? It's got the ECC108, which is an elliptical curve authentication chip where the private key stays in the chip. It has a SHA-256-based authentication uh, device. It has an encrypted EEPROM that does AES-128 in an authenticated mode. It's got a battery backed up real-time clock, a trusted platform module, and it has, it has an ARM at Mega 320p with the uh, Arduino Pro Mini bootloader, and um, so that's useful for all sorts of things. And so basically, there's a couple ways to think of this board, right? You can think of it as a cape for a BeagleBone. You can also think of it as a Arduino Pro Mini without a power supply, right? So this thing is an Arduino Pro Mini um, that has these ICs connected to it. If you put, uh, if you supply 3.3 volts to it, you know, this, it ha this is, that, you know, that's also what it is. Um, so basically, the, uh, what I'm going to do now is walk through these chips, right? So these, this, first of all, this board's uh, completely open source hardware, right? So you can go look at the semantics. Uh, each of these chips are available on DigiKey and Mouser. Um, so you can, you know, go get those. You can um, use any of these chips for either the Arduino, um, uh, BeagleBone, and Raspberry Pi. So it's all, will work with all these platforms. They're just I squared C. So that everything here I'm talking about uh, should be applicable, even if you don't buy a CryptoCape, which would be nice, but, um, um, you certainly can go get the chips individually. So the first thing I want to talk about is the EEPROM, which is not necessarily a, um, a crypto thing, but there's some very cool things that the BeagleBone does with the EEPROM, which uh, I'd like to emphasize, right? So an EEPROM is basically the thing that makes a BeagleBone cape a cape, and what happens is uh, on boot, 
the uh, BeagleBone will go out, it'll try to look for these four uh, I squared C addresses where there's an EEPROM. It'll go look at the EEPROM, look for a fixed value, and then it'll try to load a device tree blob uh, that corresponds with your CAPE. And so basically what that means is on boot, the Beagle will go probe the hardware and then load all the kernel drivers and mux all the pins automatically. And so this is actually really cool, right? So you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this in your program, right? This will all happen automatically for you on boot. Um, and so uh, that's kind of like the closest thing I know to like plug and play hardware on a uh, embedded device. So it's kind of a neat feature. And so if you're making something and it's somewhat complicated and you have to do a lot of pin muxing to get the, you know, the pins in the right order, just consider making a cape, right? And like I said, all the cape really needs to be is have an EEPROM on it that fits in this address. And then um, you can put that device tree blob into the lib firmware, and then it'll boot up and everything will be configured for you. So it's a, a very easy to work with. So uh, my GPG fingerprint's also in every EEPROM. So uh, that way, uh, you know, if you want to get a hold of me, the, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, you now have my GPG fingerprint. So if you cat, you know, the EEPROM, you'll see my fingerprint. So uh, the next thing is the real-time clock. So again, not necessarily crypto IC, but it's, it is important for security, right? So embedded systems typically have, you know, a, a real-time clock may be a luxury so for some embedded systems. But if you start doing SSL, right, there's uh, times in the SSL certs where there's a not before and not after field, right? So you're supposed to check that cert, right? And so most embedded systems think it's 1970, and so they're just kind of skipping that time check, right? Well you know, that cert's not supposed to be um, used yet. So you really want to have a real-time a real clock. And so the BeagleBone does have a real-time clock, right? But the problem is, in order to power that real-time clock, you also have to power the board. So the Beagle has this nice um, feature. It's got test points on the bottom. You can put like a single cell LiPo on it and power the whole board um, without having to go through the five volt power, uh, power jack. But, and so that will power the real-time clock. Um, but, you know, I wanted something that would just power the clock itself. And also, if you think about the crypto cape, I wanted it to kind of be um, like a two-factor thing, right? So if you remove the cape that has this hardware in it, right, that time is going to go with um, the cape. So I wanted that feature as well. And uh, so the, another thing is NTP, you know, may or may not, you may not want to use NTP, right? So there have been some security problems with NTP. Um, you know, if, you, if you're kind of interested in that, you can check out Jacob Apple, Apple, Applebaum's uh, TLS date, which will basically slurp the time from the TLS handshake. Um, so that's kind of an interesting way, uh, I think, to get time. Okay, so the next chip is the AT SHA-204. This is an authentication IC. And so it does authentication in a very, um, you know, a basic way. It's a challenge response kind of system. It uses this thing called a MAC, which is a message authentication code. So MAC is a typically a tag that accompanies some data. One of the ways to implement a MAC is with a hash function. Um, so the hash function that this chip uses is uh, SHA-256, and it also does HMAC-256. The one caveat is that it actually doesn't do straw, straight SHA-256, it actually combines internal data. Um, so unfortunately, like, it's not like a, a straight HMAC, it, it's kind of like Atmel's HMAC. Um, but it, it does apply the algorithm, but it, um, it won't quite like, be compatible with the straight up HMAC. Because it'd be nice to do like a time-based, uh, you know, the HTOP Google authentication protocol and, uh, with this, but unfortunately that's, um, it's not compatible. So the real thing that this chip helps with is the, uh, like you have a medical, like so I think it was designed for the case where you have a medical device and I'm the OEM of that device and I wanna make sure that my cables are my OEM cables. And so what will happen is um, if I'm the manufacturer, right, I can provision these chips so they all have the same key. So uh, Mac is a, is a shared key system, right? So I provision all these chips and then when they plug in the cable, we do this kind of challenge response and I should know the Mac in the cable because I'm the OEM and I'm the device and I say, hey, is this the right cable? If it's not because it's a counterfeit, right, then I don't allow data to go through the cable or I don't power it or something like this. So this, I think, is the like, industrial application of the AT SHA-204. The kind of like maker project application is kind of like module to module um, kind of authentication or like if you have like a garage door opener, right, you could do something where you have something like two devices and, uh, you know, We'll talk a little more about examples, but that's kind of that application. It does have a unique serial number and a random number generator as well. So if you, it's a very cheap way to get a random number generator on an Arduino, right? It's, Atmel has an AVR library. You just plug it in and you can get uh, random numbers. Um, you have to kind of configure it. It also draws like no power, right? So it's like a one milliamp active supply, like when it's using for that like, you know, short period of time. And then it draws 30 nanoamps when it's sleeping. So to even measure that, you need something like David Jones, um, you know, microcurrent gold, right? To use your multimeter to hook up to get that nanoamp resolution, right? Because otherwise, burden voltage, right? If you, 
Any EV blog fans? Maybe? No. All right, microcurrent gold. You should check it out. Um, okay, so use of uh, the AT SHA-204. So the Electric Imp uses the AT SHA-204. And I don't think they're using any of the crypto features, but what they're doing is, uh, so the Electric Imp is this device. You hook it up. You can kind of get your device on the web and uh, do all that cloud stuff, right? So um, with the, basically, you get that module, and you need this breakout board. And that breakout board has a unique serial number because it's using the AT SHA-204. And so what happens is when you plug your imp into a different breakout board, it'll go back to the cloud, and it'll know a different serial number, and um, it'll run different code. So with the, I think that's kind of like a cool feature, right? So if you plug in this thing into different devices, it knows it's on a different device because of the AT SHA-204's um, serial number, and then it'll do different things. Um, so th that's the one project I know using um, uh, the AT SHA-204. So the ECC-108. So this one's an interesting chip. Right, it does ECC, um, so it does the NIST curves for ECDSA. It's basically the feature of this guy. So ECDSA is elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. It's an asymmetric um, uh, algorithm. And the nice thing about this chip is it will generate the ECC private key in the hardware. And that private key, once generated, does not leave the chip. Right, so you also have the option of importing a private key. Right, so if you want to like clone a bunch of devices. But once you um, import that key, that private key can never be read. So that's a really, really nice feature. Um, so it also has this, it also has the serial number made on the number generator. Um, so like where you would use one of these is if you have, you probably have heard of uh, like firmware signing, a software signing, right? So you can set up these chips so that your server can sign the firmware, push that update, and then these devices can store that public key, right? And verify that, yep, it came from the server. And so I'd like to mention that, you know, if you're making a system, you can, uh, have a secure update mechanism and also make it hackable. And so what I mean by that is, um, right, so you can build this system, you can sign your firmware, you can push it to devices, right, but then if the user wants, because they bought this device and they own it, right, they, I believe that they should be able to run their own code, right? So you can have that mechanism if they want to have the secure update, right, and you should do that because that way you, they know it's secure and they know they're getting the right firmware, but users should be able to run code on devices that they own, and so if they want to turn that off, they should be able to do that. Um, so I don't think these, you know, having these chips is necessarily in, in conflict with kind of keeping like a, an open system. But um, yeah, for this chip, this chip is an NDA uh, spec, but Atmel does release an AVR library that will show you basically how to use um, the, uh, the signing features, which is what the kind of purpose of this chip is. And then I've written um, a, a Linux uh, compatible command line application uh, for this guy as well. So the next one on there is the AT, AS-132. Um, so this is an encrypted EEPROM. It's a AES-128, so that's kind of like, uh. But then you have a CCM mode, which is an authenticated mode, so that's kind of like, uh, right? So, um, so uh, it will basically store uh, data on the chip, and then uh, it uses a Mac, right? So you could have, the idea is you can use this chip in two ways, right? You can either store the data encrypted, right? And then you present a Mac, and then that'll let you read the data back. Um, or you can use it as kind of an encryptor, right? So you can set up chips to basically give it a 32-byte packet. It'll encrypt that packet and return it to the host, right? So then you can send it to another device with an a, a paired um, AES-132, and then that can potentially decrypt it. Um, so Atmel does have AVR code. I haven't yet been able to uh, write the Linux driver for this. Um, and it, uh, yeah, so, that's, so, so if you're looking for this one right now, um, you can look at the Atmel's code. So the 328P, right, so it's got, yeah, so like I said, it's got the Arduino 3.3 volt bootloader, and this ended up being one of the more fun devices uh, on there, right? So it's got the Arduino, right, so yay, Arduino. Um, but the thing is, you can upload sketches from the Beagle to the Atmega, right? So I tied the UART lines uh, from the Beagle bone to the serial UART to the Atmega. So you can program, basically you can program your um, Arduino from a Beagle bone. And, but see, I wanted this, so if you could do that in software, the problem was, well, if there was a software vulnerability, I didn't want anyone to be able to do this, right? So I put uh, jumpers on there, and you can only do this if you have the jumpers attached, right? So if you pull, so the board comes without the jumpers, so that means you can't do it by default, but if you soldered, uh, you know, 0.1 inch uh, headers on there, put jumpers on, you can flash your Arduino sketches into the Atmega, pull the jumpers off, and then, you know, software can't change this, right? You can also use the ISP programming header, uh, so you see the little six guys next to there, you can use something like a pocket programmer. Uh, the board technically is not five volt friendly because of this oscillator, which I'll talk about a little later. So if you do, you know, make sure to switch it to no power mode, but you can also program the Atmega right from ISP and Arduino ID and everything is fine. So the really nice thing about that, uh, which may not be obvious, is there's just so much 
code out there for Arduino devices, right? So I've taken like the fingerprint sensor and made like a two-factor thing in like minutes because I took someone's code library on someone's forum, right, under some beerware license, and it's like, ah, oh, fine. And um, right, loaded it, flashed that into that mega, right, and everything works. And then I'm able to interface to that from the Beagle because I, the I squared C lines are the same. So you put a little I squared C handler on there, and now you can communicate from the Beagle bone to the at mega um, very easily. So my original idea was to put the software, the uh, crypto library NACL on there. So uh, for those who haven't heard about NACL or SALT, um, it's kind of like um, uh, there's a lot of interest in the academic community about this library. It has some of the primitives are available for AVR. Uh, but the, like the whole crypto box API isn't there. Um, also, because the chip is running at eight megahertz, it'd be a little slow. Um, there's also some interesting glitch attacks you can do on, on an at mega. Um, so if you if you um, so so it's for a whole bunch of reasons, it's maybe not the best to run a crypto library. But um, um, that was the original idea. And so yeah, so I wrote this article, uh, Linux Journal. If you guys read that in May 2014 to kind of show the whole Arduino uh, concept, right? So I explained a lot about this device tree, so if you're kind of interested in kind of how the Linux background of that, uh, you should check out that article. And this is the uh, schematic, right? So basically, this is like the Arduino on a breadboard schematic, right? So it's just got the ISP, it's got the uh, LED on the um, normal spot that Arduino Uno has got it. The only thing that's really new about this is, the, uh, so I'm tying it to the BeagleBones UART4, right, and um, uh, tying that reset line to a GPIO. So that's also a nice feature because then I can software reset the at mega from the BeagleBone. Uh, so if I just want to reset it, right, I can have a script or something or put, make a cron. You can use all this Linux features, right, to control this at mega, um, which is kind of, I don't know, I've, ha I've had a lot more fun with it than I, than I originally anticipated. So the TPM is an interesting chip. So you, the TPM has been around for a while. Uh, there was, it got a lot of, um, there was like a big kind of outrage to the TPM when it first came out because of the DRM capabilities. And uh, um, it, it's probably in each of your laptops and it's, you know, it's not on by default, so you may not even know it as a low pin count version. But um, so the, pro the things against the TPM is that it can kind of know your state of your system, right? So privacy advocates are uh, appropriately concerned about the TPM knowing exactly what's on your, uh, um, you know, how your system is configured. But if you think about it, right, if you're building an embedded system, that's like exactly what you want, right? So you build this embedded appliance, you want it to do this one thing, right? You're gonna put it, if you put a TPM on it, you really wanna know that thing's doing exactly what you think it's doing, right? So I think TPMs uh, make a lot of sense in an embedded environment, um, probably much more so they do in a, a consumer laptop environment. So cryptographically, the TPM is actually kind of limited, right? It only does RSA 2048, it has SHA-1, um, but it has some interest, it has these little features there that really make uh, a lot of different functionality, right? So it's got this concept called platform control registers. So platform control register is a 20 byte register that you can only write to with this extend operation. And so um, the extend operation is defined there. Basically, you have to take the SHA-1 of the current value of the platform control register plus some input, right? So what that means is you can only kind of progress the PCR in one direction, right? So you can only keep adding input to that. And so based on that one feature, you can do things um, like secure boot and remote attestation. And so this is kind of, um, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but that, that's kind of an interesting feature that's kind of specific to a TPM. So the TPM also has this key arc, hierarchy concept. Um, it can, you know, has different keys in there that'll wrap other keys, uh, starting with an endorsement key and a storage root key or a shark. So yeah, so I have this, the TPM I have on there, you know, is fine, like I've been able to use it for different things. There are some other ones that's like, oh man, like, why don't I pick that, right? So they have, uh, so Atmel has a version of the TPM without this external oscillator. So it's like, because that oscillator is preventing the board from being five volt friendly, I was like, oh man. Then they actually have versions that are FIPS 142 certified. So if you're kind of into the whole certification thing, right, this certification costs a lot of money. Um, and the, all the, uh, the whole module is FIPS 142 certified. So that's kind of a neat thing. And then um, the other thing is for people who have, you know, maybe have used this, right? Uh, so this, the TPM version I picked ships in compliance mode. And so what the compliance mode means is that it has an endorsement key on the TPM, right? So you get it, it has an endorsement key, things will work. Uh, the problem is everybody has the same key. Um, so that's like a test vector, right? And so, um, so I didn't actually learn about this until afterwards because I was like, hey, everything's working. Um, and then I was like, oh, 
why is this key the same on this board? Um, and then so I was like, oh, I picked the compliance mode version. So there is a way you can clear that, right? You, you, uh, so I haven't yet put that up on like a, my website, but you basically have to clear the TPM. Um, you can generate a new endorsement key, um, which is probably good anyway, because again, there was privacy concerns about the endorsement key. So you'll generate your own endorsement key. It can't be tracked with TPM. Um, but yeah, so that was, I was kind of like, oh man. All right, so um, the other thing that would be nice is, uh, so there's this new, in, uh, I, don't, oh, I don't know how new, but there's this industrial version of the BeagleBone called Blue Steel. Um, and so what they did is they removed the HDMI framer and they removed the EMMC, right? And then it can be supported for industrial applications. So this is again, one of those things where the BeagleBone, it, you know, you can use it in the product. And if you're doing something, you know, either crazy, some cold environment or something really hot, you can actually get an industrial BeagleBone, which I think is pretty cool. And so um, there's, there's a TBM version that will do uh, industrial, uh, support industrial regions, ranges. So yeah, so the issue with the TBM is there's a, so it's covered by a spec, right? And specs are covered by committees. And so then you end up having very large specs. And so with the TBM, there's a lot of software if you're using with Linux that you have to get through before you actually talk to the actual hardware, right? You have to go through a device driver, and then there's this whole trusted computing software stack that you have to go through and that has all these different layers. Um, and then you finally get to your application. Um, so the, in Linux, there's this package called Trousers, which essentially uh, will implement this. Um, so you really kind of have to worry about it, but it's like this kind of kind of a lot of bloat you have to kind of bring in just to use the TPM. If you're trying to do this on an AVR, uh, so it is possible, right? You can talk to the chip just at the device driver level. Um, so Atmel has code in their dev kits that will use uh, the AVR code. So you can use TPMs on AVRs. Um, typically, you know, you, you've probably only seen them in, in laptops or these kind of things. Uh, but uh, I haven't yet tried that, but I have seen the code for the uh, AVR. So what can you do with a TPM? Well, so the thing, uh, so there's some TPM specific features. The first one is called Secure Boot, and that's a more like a stronger version of Trusted Boot. And essentially, what this is is when the when the computer boots, it'll use that PCR extend function, right? So your uh, computer will boot. That bootloader before it is executed will go out and take a measurement of it. So the measurement is essentially that extend operation. It hashes that input, puts that into a PCR, and then uh, that your you know second stage bootloader will. Your first stage bootloader will verify your second stage bootloader. Your second stage bootloader will verify your kernel. And then your kernel will verify your init FS, right? And keep going and load everything into the PCRs. And so when you finally get into user space, all your PCRs are populated. Now, if none of that changed, right, you would expect to see the same PCRs every time you booted. And so um, that's kind of with secure boot, um, one thing you could do is to kind of like lock down those PCR values and say, okay, I only want to do things if things are at this certain PCR state. So that's known as uh, sealing data. So you can actually encrypt data to PCR values, right? So that means if anything in your boot chain has changed, you will not be able to decrypt something on your uh, device, right? So that may either be good or bad, depending on what you're doing, but if you were concerned about some sort of uh, kernel uh, vulnerability or someone changing that, right, that data would be essentially inaccessible because the PCR values changed. Now, so an embedded system, this is a little bit tricky because on a laptop you have, uh, right, the luxury of having a BIOS and that, you know, you have Grub, right, and so there's a lot of support for this because, you know, TPMs are made by vendors such as, you know, like Microsoft likes TPMs, right, and so they want things to work for them. Uh, so the embedded system, we're kind of a little bit out of luck, right, the BeagleBone uses U-Boot, and then, right, there's no BIOS, um, and so uh, this guy, Teddy Reed, wrote this uh, lib sboot basically to hook in the TPM into U-Boot, so you have to kind of install that. Um, and then use the Linux um, integrity subsystem, which is called IMA, to get uh, all the different measurements of uh, basically once you pass the bootloader stage. Um, so uh, the, then the TPM supports this feature called attestation. Attestation is the ability to um, take that PCR value and then kind of prove that to a remote entity. Right, so this is again where privacy people kind of uh, freak out, right, again appropriately, because if you have a laptop and it boots and the PCR values are one thing, Remote, remote attestation means I can, you know, if I'm a content provider, I go ask your laptop, hey, um, what are the PCR values? And you tell me. And I go, hmm, that doesn't match. So I'm not going to show you this movie, right? And so that's kind of concerning, right? But again, in an embedded system, you kind of actually, you know, want that feature if you're designing an embedded system, right? Because you want your uh, device to kind of boot in a certain mode. And so, um, so TPMs support this attestation feature, which I think, um, you know, makes actually sense in an embedded world. And so the nice thing about TPMs is there's actually a little more software support than some of the other chips. So through a software interface called the PKCS11, which essentially is a library that will kind of 
allow, it's a smart card library, and a TPM can look like a smart card. You can uh, store RSA keys in the TPM. So for like SSH, right, I have my SSH keys stored in the TPM on my BeagleBone, right? So the SSH key never touches the BeagleBone. Uh, and so the developer of this, uh, of this library, I think, is at Hope. Uh, he may be in the audience, I don't know. But he is very, like, essentially allows you to configure SSH to generate and store your SSH key right in the TPM. It never touches the software. And so this, it, the same could be done with SSL. Um, and it also could possibly be done with GPG, although I don't know if anyone's done that yet. And so this, to me, is a very uh, attractive feature, right? So you, uh, that whole, the harp lead situation, right? Right, it would have been less bad with a hardware security module because you would have still um, leaked, you know, the initial session key and whatever secrets were there. But that private uh, key would never have gone into the software, and so it never had been an opportunity to been read by a software vulnerability. Um, so yeah, so TPM is called things measuring. This is my obligatory meme picture, right? So measure all the things, um, right? And so if you have a Raspberry Pi. I don't want you to feel left out, right? So you can use all those chips, um, right? It's just the I squared C interface. And uh, I'll be putting something up on Tindy that is a little Frankenstein adapter, right? So um, yeah, so the form factor is not the great, but hey, if you really want to use the CryptoCape on a Raspberry Pi, um, so I got this little board. So the uh, again, on the Raspberry Pi, if you want to use the CryptoCape, basically, you just got to tie the UARTs, um, tie GPIO to reset the at mega. And then you have the I squared C. The problem is the TPM driver isn't available until 3.13. So I, uh, we backported it for BeagleBone, but um, I, don't, I don't think Raspberry Pi runs a 3.13 uh, yet. So the TPM might be a little bit uh, lacking there. So when would you want to use EGIC for whatever project? So the AT SHA-204 is really good for basic authentication and small scale systems, right? Because it's a shared key system, it's really hard to kind of manage if you were doing uh, like a large deployment, but if you just have a couple devices and you um, want to make sure that those devices are only talking to you know your own devices, um, the AT or if you have a module, right? So if you have, make a module and you plug it into your Raspberry Pi, you want to make sure it's um, that your module. Uh, the AT SHA of two of four, you just put them on each end, you configure them, um, and that would be uh, I think a good use of the AT SHA two of four. The ECC one hundred eight does provide stronger authentication, right? Because it has Asymmetric cryptography, which is, it has that non-repudiation feature. So you would want to use these um, if you needed some sort of PKI support. Um, and if, like if you were doing like the server firmware uh, model, uh, you know, the ECC 108 would be good because you can have the server generate a, a, a key, right, distribute that public key to all your devices, and then uh, devices can authenticate that public key and then you know, accept the firmware. So the 132, right, this is the encrypted EEPROM. Uh, the nice thing, uh, right, it has the confidentiality and the authentication mode, right? So you could have, like your Arduino, you could use load everything in this AES-132. And then because it needs this authentication mode, you can still require some sort of input. Um, so if you have some sort of password thing that's the Mac, right, you kind of expose that. And then you can make sure that if the device is sitting around somewhere, that people can't access that information on the chip. Uh, it could also probably store um, keys, right? It's only a 32 kilobyte EEPROM, so there's not a whole lot of room. Um, and the TPM would be the chip to use if you uh, needed, um, you know, like more sophisticated software support or anything dealing with RSA. And so, just as you know, the caveat, right? None of these chips will automatically secure your project, um, right? So you still have to, um, just like you, you pick out some sort of component, passive component. You can't just like plop that on and expect it to work, right? You actually have to kind of like design with it, right? So the same thing with these. Um, so there's that. Okay, so I, I want to kind of talk about a project that um, I think is a good use for some of these devices. So running Tor on a BeagleBone Black. And so I ran Tor on a BeagleBone Black for about nine months. Um, so I had a Tor relay. And uh, I just want to talk basically what, what Tor is, um, kind of the experiences of running that on a home network, and uh, some, some things I think are nice with a BeagleBone that you can do with a Tor relay. Um, so for those that don't know, uh, Tor is an anonymity overlay network. So it's a network that runs on other networks. Uh, provides anonymity in the fact that it um, protects your IP address. And so if uh, you should probably follow this Twitter account, right? So this is a hilarious Twitter account. What it is is um, it will tweet any time somebody in the U.S. Congress or Senate makes an anonymous Wikipedia edit, right? So it knows because your IP address is geolocatable, right? It knows the subnet that is reserved for .govs, and it knows, hey, this is the US Congress. And anytime one of those staffers or anyone gets on there and changes Wikipedia, it tweets. And it's kind of hilarious, and it kind of really makes you uh, 
I don't know. It, it doesn't make you trust Wikipedia as much. But so that's why you should always go to the talk page, right, and see the background. Um, but I think the one like the other day was uh, one of the Russian Today uh, journalists, right? It said uh, someone in the Congress made a change that like this Russian Today is a journalist, and he changed it, or he or she changed it to this person is a Russian propagandist. Uh, so, so th if you're you know a, a government staffer, you probably should use Tor because uh, you won't show up on this Twitter uh, thing. I don't know if any of you are here in the audience, but uh, you don't have to tell me. Um, so yeah, it also has strong censorship resistance. So there's this concept of Tor bridges, right? They were basically designed to um, block the access to Tor. So censors decided or realized that, hey, we can block Tor very easily if we block people's access to Tor. And Tor responded with the concept of bridges. Um, and ooh, Tor is often used when governments try to shut down the internet. So some governments are better uh, than others at doing this. The last example, um, I think, was Turkey, right? And Turkey tried to block access to Twitter, I think, and then people were using Orbot on their phones to access Tor. So you, and Tor, what's nice about the Tor project, it has these very nice metrics, right? So you can go see and look up, you know, people connecting to Tor from Turkey in this time period, and you'll see this nice spike um, that corresponds to uh, when this whole thing was happening. And so, yeah, so there's a little, what's ironic about this, I find, is, you know, the allegations that uh, the government is now is snooping on anyone that's you know running tour. So if you have this nice patriotic poster saying run a tour relay, and well, uh, maybe it's not the best message. Um, but uh, so for those that don't know, uh, just a very quick primer how tour works and where your BeagleBone fits in. So uh, the way tour works is you have a bunch of nodes, right? And so you have a some of the nodes are special nodes and um, that do different things, and then you have your client. So your client in this case is Alice. Alice is always trying to talk to Bob, who's on the other end of the network. So uh, Alice wants to use Tor. Uh, so the problem that Alice initially uh, finds is that how does she discover the first entry in the Tor network? Well, there's these servers called directory servers, uh, called in this case Dave, and Alice goes to the directory server and says, hey, give me the list of all the uh, Tor relays. And uh, Dave responds, here's the Tor relays. And then Alice can build a, a circuit through the network and so, um, right, and so the green arrows represent encrypted uh, communication. The red arrow is unencrypted. Tor does not encrypt the internet. So if you request something unencrypted in Tor, right, it'll output from the exit relays unencrypted, right? It doesn't automatically encrypt that. So that's why you should always use like HTTPS when you're using Tor um, or use uh, Tails so that you'll get, you know, kind of all this set up. But um, if you ask for something unencrypted, the key point is that it comes out unencrypted um, at the end of Tor. And so if you run a BeagleBone Black Relay, you, this, you'll, your relay will participate in this network. Um, this is unlike that Onion Pie project. So the Onion Pie project is a kind of like a transparent uh, proxy. And um, the only issue that I have kind of with the Onion Pie project is that in order to really use Tor effectively, you really should be using the Tor browser or Tails. And so um, if you're using like IE with the Onion Pie, the uh, Internet Explorer can potentially leak the DNS information, right? So Tor spent a lot of effort trying to make this browser. And um, you know, if you first go to a DNS request and say, this is the IP that I want to go to, right, and everyone sees that IP, and then you go through Tor, then that doesn't really help you. Um, so you should use uh, the Tor browser or Tails. And then, of course, you can change your uh, um, identity uh, you know, through the Tor network. So why do this on uh, BeagleBone? And so I think there's a couple uh, advantages to running this on a BeagleBone, especially on a home network. So one, you have the advantage that it's dedicated hardware. So you may, I, I particularly didn't want to run Tor on my you know, main computer, right? I kind of wanted that separate into a whole different system. Um, so that's a nice feature of running this on a BeagleBone, right? So it's also very low power, right? The BeagleBone doesn't you know, um, draw that much power, right? Tor is green, right? Green is good for everybody. Um, Right, has, has a small physical footprint, right? So this is not gonna be a server that's gonna take up a lot of space on your counter and maybe someone will complain like why you have this computer over here, right? So it's a very nice little small thing you kind of put in the corner. It's, um, right, it's, you basically think of it as a low maintenance appliance, right? So I only had to, my relay only reset twice in nine months. So the one time uh, that I went offline was Heartbleed, right? So everyone was supposed to up upgrade their relay, so I did that. And then I was going to a conference and I had a bunch of BeagleBones plugged in and I unplugged the wrong one. Uh, so that was the second time that my BeagleBone essentially went, but otherwise it ran for basically nine months uh, without any problem. You can tune it, right, for lower bandwidth consumption, right? So Tor, there's this kind of conflict between how much bandwidth you give to Tor and how, you know, what you, um, can use for a home network, so you can kind of tweak that bandwidth. Um, and so this was a graph. It's not a net, 
I had limited the bandwidth on my Tor relay, so it's not, this is not necessarily very fast bandwidth, and I think that's like 400K. Um, this is after 30 months of running. Um, but what I think is really a nice, kind of like the driving thing, is you can make custom hardware for the uh, Tor relay, right? And so typically you have a Tor relay, and you don't want to manipulate it, you have to log in over SSH, right? So what I did uh, for in this one is I was having problems with the bandwidth, and I would keep adjusting the bandwidth rate, right? And um, and so if you put a rotary, rotary potentiometer on the ADC pins of the BeagleBone, you can use the Python stem library, and now I can adjust the bandwidth of my relay with a knob, right? So, um, so I think it's kind of a neat way to kind of combine hardware with the server, right? So I think when people, so I'm interested in kind of keeping going with this project. I'm trying to run one now and see how fast it can go. But when you can kind of physically interact with something, I think that kind of the response to that is a lot more than just running the relay and, oh, it's running on some server somewhere. And then I added a little front panel interface. It would tell me the, uh, um, you know, how much bandwidth it was using relative to my uh, max bandwidth in my home network. And then you, know, you always have to have a blinking LED. Um, so I added one of those. So you know, what to expect when you're, uh, you're running a Tor relay on a home network with a BeagleBone. Uh, so there's a couple things that kind of uh, ran in there, right? So you, there's this balance you kind of have to play, right? So, so Tor would really like it if you just gave a lot of bandwidth to them, and because uh, then you're participating, you're going the uh, Tor network. It has a lot of bandwidth, um, but the problem is like you also want to use your bandwidth, right? So there's kind of a tweaking that you have to do, and so that's eventually why I ended up making that uh, knob so I can kind of adjust things. Um, so all Tor relays are public IPs, and what some providers do, I've noticed, is they'll just go grab all the Tor relays and just blacklist them. Right, so typically they're, they'll do this for exits because exits, when you pop out of the Tor network, if there's abuse in Tor, right, that'll be the ones that'll kind of they'll come out from an exit. Um, but so for there was like a period of time where I couldn't get to Hulu, and Hulu was like, "You're running this anonymizer network," and I responded to them, and I was like, "No, like, uh, okay, I like I'm running this Tor middle relay. This is why people sh should run Tor. This is why it's important." And by the way, I'm in the United States, and they go, "Oh, okay, you're in the U.S. All right, we'll let you have Tor again, or we'll let you have Hulu again." So. Um, uh, uh, some other weird ones, like I couldn't get to Navy.mil, and Tor you know, was originally funded by the US Navy, so that was kind of ironic. And then I was looking up PKCS11 standards, and I, that RSA site was blocked from Tor, and I was like, do you, you guys are not, you know, I don't know. So, so you, if you do run one at home, um, you, know, you, you may experience some of this stuff if you value kind of helping uh, people access the internet, and you'll have to kind of make a judgment call of you know, whether you, you want to do that. Um, the other thing is you have to carefully manage the memory, right? So the um, BeagleBone is kind of memory restricted. And uh, that's where I found, because Tor will open up a lot of connections and won't necessarily use them all at once. Um, so that's where I think you'll hit the limiting, um, you know, the limiting component. I'm trying to run one now, uh, so we'll see. Um, also, you're gonna wanna do some basic hardening um, you know, to kind of get everything ready. So uh, yeah, so I'm writing this book. Um, so I'm trying to show some other cool things to do with the CryptoCape and the BeagleBone. Um, so I've got, we talked about Tor uh, in this book here that's come out in September. I'm showing how to do a Tor bridge with an OBS3 uh, proxy. Um, you'll see how to do like two-factor authentication with a, a fingerprint sensor, loading that to the CryptoCape. I use the TPM to wrap GPG keys. And then uh, the last thing is I run an IRC network and I have Biddleby and CNC and then show how to use all that with OTR. Um, so that's all running on the BeagleBone. And uh, lastly, I'm giving a talk. You'll see me again at DEF CON if you're going to DEF CON. I'm giving a talk on the NSA playset with uh, Michael Osman and uh, some other people. And if you want a cool project to do with a BeagleBone or CryptoCape, I recommend you go to that talk because I'll be showing how to make a hardware implant that attaches to I squared C and then can exfiltrate data out uh, GSM. Um, and there's resources, and uh, I think we have some time for questions. Thank you. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I set the, so the question is how do I control the system reset uh, line for that mega, right? So I just use the GPIO. Um, I, I think I got a resistor in there that's tied to the, um, like the high voltage there, so like a pull up, and then uh, I default that GPIO to high, right? And then so uh, if I wanna reset it um, in software, I just tell, hey, uh, tell the Beagle to pull that GPIO low, and that'll um, short out that line and allow the uh, Amega to reset. 
Yes, yeah, yes, yes. And, and, and yeah, so I should say it's also using AVR dude. So AVR dude is the thing pushing, um, just like you would do uh, for the Arduino ID. That's, yes, 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 yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so the question was about the source of entropy. So that's a very good question. Um, the one I don't have the answer to. Uh, so, right, so the hardware manufacturers, um, even Atmel, who's very good about pushing out a lot of specs, they're, how they do random number generators is very proprietary. Um, so the short answer is I don't know. I think the speculation is probably like they're using some sort of thermal noise uh, to generate that. Um, but, um, you know, unfortunately they don't release those details. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so everything's open source hardware, so, oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's cool. That's, I made it so people would learn about this and try to integrate it, so I don't, I, that's fine. Uh, I don't necessarily, there's nothing against that, and I think it's cool if people are using more hardware crypto. I don't know, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, so I, I occasionally get a lot of Bitcoin interest, right? Um, so the problem, um, it's not really, so the hashing uh, chip on there, like it's, I can't really work with Bitcoin because it adds this um, um, other like custom data to that. And then the other problem is the elliptical curve chip is NIST, right? So it's not the Bitcoin curve. So I'd be, it'd be kind of cool. I think one of the things I was intending to make like a Bitcoin wallet maybe, but unfortunately it's not the same. It's not the right uh, EC curve. Okay, so any other questions? I guess shout them out, because I having, maybe that's it. Okay, any last rounds? All right, thank you very much for coming to the talk. <laughs>